Okay, so um, I'd like to welcome our next speaker, who is Dr. Jennifer Wells. Um, Dr. Wells is a graduate of the Georgetown um, University Medical School, where she was an AOA member. Um, she then went on to do her internship and residency at the University of California at San Francisco. Um, she followed that with a second residency in psychiatry at the Virginia Tech Carilion um, program. Um, and she is currently there in Roanoke, Virginia, practicing. Um, her practice is largely um, pregnant women with psychiatric issues um, with a focus on substance abuse. Um, welcome, Dr. Wells. Thank you. So good morning. Good morning. I always uh, like to start with like Bueller, Bueller, anyone? Bueller? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then you can tell the age group that you're speaking with. Um, so today I'm going to talk about psychiatric issues of the female patient. Um, this uh, field usually takes me about two weeks to go through, so I hope you bought a change of clothes, and some sleeping bags. <laughs> Um, and I'd like to make a couple disclaimers as I, as I begin. I normally speak on uh, substance use disorders and psychotropics in pregnancy, so this is a bit of a new topic for me. And so I need you to go easy on me. I'm a little bit nervous up here. I'm going to roll through some stuff. It was pretty difficult for me to try and uh, scale down all of psychiatry and women to about 50 minutes of talking. So we got a bunch of slides. Um, I would really love it. If you did whatever you needed to, shook your head, raised a card, um, shouted my name and said, yeah, well, this is something we need to know about or really know we got this. Uh, I took a shot in the dark at some of the very basic issues in psychiatry that I think are important and then some of my personal uh, tips, tidbits that are important to me and if you, you're going to see throughout this slide, I do refer a lot to pregnancy because that is what I do most of the time and that's really important to me. So. Let's go ahead and get started. So the objectives for today, we're going to look at uh, mood and anxiety disorders in women, right? It's a very big topic, but it's very, very important. And if you're in your practice and you think, oh, I don't see very many of these, like my patients are particularly happy. <laughs> the, the problem is not having a happy population. The problem is that you're missing it. So <laughs> we need to talk about how we're going to screen for these things and then also how prevalent the problem is because it's ginormous. And then I want to go through some basic pharmacologic strategies, the basic drugs that you probably use every day. I think, does everybody use SSRIs routinely in their practice? Right, good. Thank you, a card. Yeah, two cards. <laughs> so, um, I'll, uh, I'll go through some of those, but I also want, uh, in general, you know, uh, SSRIs are not all the same. Seems like they are, like, ooh, let's give Zoloft to everybody, or ooh, Selexa, I like it. So I'm going to try and personalize your treatment to fit um, specific symptoms that you see. And then I, as a psychiatrist, have a particular problem with the chronic use of benzodiazepines in a lot of patients. And, um, it's a little bit, I'm, I might get a little bit on my soapbox, so you can tell me to get off if it gets to be heavy-handed, but I just want to spend a little bit of time talking about how we set healthy boundaries for our patients and what we should be trying to achieve if you do use benzodiazepines regularly, which I would suggest you do not, um, and then how we, how we manage the treatment uh, if you are using them. And then at the end, if there's time, I'm going to try to give a basic role, uh, show you a basic role that hormones play in psychiatric illness. Uh, I'm sure all of you have noticed that it does play a role. And it's, it's very complicated. The data uh, is not conclusive. There's a lot of um, controversy about what hormone is, is, plays a part in, in what uh, axis. And in general, we know that they all sort of interact together. So we'll just say a few words about that. So why do we care? Well, if we look worldwide, 350 million people in the world suffer from depression. That's a pretty big number, right? That's about 5% of the world population. So I really feel like what I do is pretty important. I look at, in the US, 16 million US adults had at least one major depressive episode in 2012. I like that that's job security for myself, but I also like <laughs> knowing uh, that it's a big number. We have a big job to do. And we do know we're going to come over this time and time again because we're dealing with women patients, right, that <coughs> women are about twice as likely to suffer from depression than men. 
Anxiety disorders are about twice as common in women as in men. The reasons for that are, are super complex and multifactorial, but it nonetheless exists and it's something we need to pay attention to for all people who are treating women. I in particular care that 20% of people with major depressive disorder develop psychotic symptoms, right? Those are the people that are in danger of hurting themselves, hurting others, hurting their babies. So we need to pay particular attention to them. And speaking of babies, 10 to 15%, and some people would estimate as high as 20 or 25% of women develop postpartum depression. So for my OBs in the audience and FPs and people who deliver, right, it's, it's pretty critical that these women are identified. So this here looks at um, disability adjusted life years, and it's more just to let us know that mental disorders make up three of the top 10 leading causes of disease burden in middle income countries and four of the leading 10 in high income countries, right? So you can see all that blue, this whole thing is uh, <coughs> psychiatric disorders and all that blue and black is anxiety, bipolar and unipolar depression. So I'm gonna try to break it down. We're gonna do a little bit of mood disorders, do a little bit of anxiety, and then we're gonna come on the back end and talk a little bit about benzos and hormones. So let's look at major depressive disorder and mood disorders in general. Um, the two that I wanna focus on are major depressive disorder and bipolar disorder. I, of course, because I do psychiatry and OB, have a particular interest in the hormonal transitions and the mood disorders that are associated with that. I think they're pretty specific and they're likely to be referred to someone like myself if you have someone like myself in your community. So I'm happy to speak on any of the, the Disorders you see at the bottom of the slide during the week, I'm here. I can always speak to it. If there's a question, I can speak to it. But I'm going to limit myself today to sort of the big disorders we deal with every day. So major depressive disorder. So unipolar depression is the most disabling illness for women in the world, right? It accounts for 40, about 42% of disability from neuropsychiatric disorders compared to about 30% in men, right? So much, much more in women. It's now considered the leading cause of disease-related disability in the world. And uh, I put this up here just recently. I had a patient who suffers from major depressive disorder and some anxiety, and she needed short-term disability filled out, and I fill it all out, and you know it's noxious and horrible, and it takes all this time, and you send it in. And the disability company calls me back and um, had the audacity to say to me, well, it's, is it just depression? And I, I like, I didn't... Uh, I lost my, you know, SHIT. I was like, seriously, man? Like, is this the job you do? Like, do you have any idea? I was like, I'm going to send you some slides. You get back to me. <laughs> so I'm happy to report she got her disability. <clears throat> but so here, that's the worldwide. Worldwide look at depression. And here's a snapshot of depression in America. So look at this. Across all age groups, women outlast men, right? They have... Uh, almost twice as much depression. We're gonna see this is true in anxiety as well, and it reaches 10%, 15% in some um, decades of life. So on average, as I said, women experience major depression and dysthymia twice as often as men. Their lifetime prevalence is 20% versus 10% in men. And then, as I like to point out, there are higher rates of depression in women through puberty, persisting throughout the childbearing years, and then it sort of slowly declines with a small reemergence at the menopausal transition. So again, right, hormonal transitions play a really important role in mood disorders. We see this time and again, even though the etiology of this isn't that well known. So here we look at just 12 month prevalence of depression among US adults, and you can see there's women popping up twice as frequently as men. So one thing I want to point out, I keep coming back to this, uh, in the perinatal period, right, it's a particularly important time that we're screening and looking for depression. Pregnancy, we now know, is not protective, right? We used to think that a couple decades ago, like, ooh, you're pregnant, everybody's happy, it's fantastic, but it's not. <laughs> the perinatal period is a, is a really unique period of, of so much change, physical, hormonal, emotional change and that can precipitate and more commonly exacerbate pre-existing psychiatric symptoms. And what matters to me a whole lot, because I sit in an OB clinic as a psychiatrist with the direct referral of patients to me, that maternal depression 
seriously affects the interactions between mothers and children. And it can create a lifelong impact on a children's emotional and social development. Right? We now have data coming out that some of our SSRIs given to mothers actually improves the emotional and learning health of their children simply by treating the mother. No intervention for the child. So that's pretty significant. And we know that maternal depression predicts behavior problems, developmental delays, and school problems in children, independent of socioeconomic status. Simple maternal depression. So if that isn't enough to bring heightened awareness to this in your practice, I'm not sure much is. One in seven women experience perinatal depression, right? So ACOG's current recommendation is that all pregnant women be screened at least once during the perinatal period. And I'm happy to report that the, that is being done. Those numbers are increasing year after year. So we're getting good screening. Don't get me started tomorrow. You can join me as I get started on is that screening being done for substance use disorders in pregnant women? Because we're lagging a little behind in that. But I'll get back on that soapbox tomorrow. Um, so major depressive disorder. So let's all go back to medical school and remember our little exam questions and SIGI CAPS, right? That's how we diagnose major depressive disorder. There's core symptoms of depressed mood and reduced interest. And then we have somatic symptoms, appetite, sleep, energy, cognitive symptoms. I can't think, I can't concentrate. A lot of guilt, a lot of ruminative thoughts. And then of course, suicidal ideation. So what you need for the diagnosis is five out of nine in the last two weeks. This is another one. It, it, it's a broader list of signs of depression and I included it in there just so you'll have it. I think a lot of people experience irritability, restlessness. They're annoyed. If they're working, they don't feel like going through their day. It's just too much, too long. So those are things to look out for. So one of the things I'd like to bring uh, to this discussion and hear from you guys if you have it is how you use your SSRIs, right? So that's our frontline treatment for depression. It's fairly easy, doesn't have that many side effects. Um, and do you guys, you can either nod your head or raise a card, something, show me a little love. Um, <laughs> do, does, and do you guys tend to use one antidepressant or one or two that are like your go-tos or, or do you use 10, 12? So who's one, two? Thank you. Okay, good. And who's like five, six, seven, eight? Okay, well, good on you guys. So what I want to do is just spend a little time looking over how you can use your various SSRs because of their side effect profiles and some of because their inherent nature, why they're better for some uses than others. We do know, right, psychiatric disorders occur together. They're co-occurring. Anxiety, right, depression, substance use. They're, often found together. So that is something that you can use in playing uh, with your drug of choice. So I've listed some things here. Uh, citalopram is generally associated with the least stomach upset, and almost all SSRIs have some. E-citalopram is the one that the study has been done on improved child depressive symptoms in treatment with the mother that I just referred to. It uh, probably applies to all SSRIs, but that's what the study is done on. Um, we look at a lot of your patients, although you might not be aware of it because it often takes directed questioning or suffering from OCD-like symptoms, right? They pick stuff, they pick their eyebrows, they pick their hair, they pick their skin, and you don't see it because they're wearing clothes. Those people could be treated with other forms, right? Like uh, Luvox, fluvoxamine. And then when patients complain of certain side effects, sometimes we can use that to our advantage, like sexual dysfunction. There are a lot of people who actually find uh, sort of a uh, hyper drive of their, uh, hyper sex drive, sorry, uh, it is annoying. They don't like it. And an SSRI can be used to, to downplay that. Or a lot of our uh, medications have a side effect of sedation. And that can be used when people can't sleep, which is very common in uh, depression. Um, in the SNRIs, right, we have venlafaxine, which gives you kind of a kick. That's one of the things associated with. So people who have, suffer a lot of fatigue, I tend to kick that in. DNRIs, like bupropion, used often in people who have substance use disorders because it has a little dopamine agonism, gives you a little boost to a system that we generally believe is low in people with substance use disorders. Um, it also has a nice smoking cessation, right? Zyban is what it's marketed for to help with smoking sensation. A lot of our patients smoke, especially in the, e in the southeast, which is my particular neck of the woods. Um, 
And mirtazapine has a couple interesting side effects, one for mood, but also at low doses, it, it's very sleep inducing and it increases appetite a lot. So it can be used a lot in those cases. So here are some cases. So Mark, 52 year old male with a history of alcoholism, poor attention and motivation, who complains of worsening depression. What does everybody want to give him? Yay! So bupropion is a very good choice, right? History of alcoholism, substance use disorder, gives you a little bit of that dopamine boost. Poor attention and motivation. Uh, Wellbutrin, bupropion is generally considered a third line agent for ADHD, and we see a lot of ADHD, comorbid psychiatric conditions in substance abuse, in depression and anxiety, as I said earlier. What about Carla? She's a 25-year-old pregnant female with three other children in the home who complains of depression. What should we give her? Okay, I love it. Y'all are listening. So Lexapro is probably a very good choice, Escitalopram, right? Because we have good evidence that we're going to affect the health of the children that are already in her home. It's generally considered safe in pregnancy. That's a whole other topic. But I use psychotropics every day fairly routinely and feel very comfortable with the use of SSRIs in pregnancy. And what about Martha? Poor Martha's 46-year-old cachectic female with worsening depression and insomnia. So like mirtazapine, right? It gives her a chance to eat. And the weight gain associated with mirtazapine, so for your regular patients who are stressing it out, it's about 5 to 8 pounds. So it's really... Pretty, pretty minor on the scale of weight gain in, in my neck of the woods. Um, and helps with depression. <laughs> well, when you're talking about something like Seroquel that's like 35 pounds, you'll take five. <laughs> so, okay. So I never uh, want to be uh, not talking about psychotherapy. It's incredibly important just because it's not what I do. I'm sort of in the business of medication. I, I can't tell you how important psychotherapy is at all aspects of psychiatric diseases. So I've included here some websites to help you look at what types of therapy. I think probably in your practices, the best thing you could do is get a list of therapists. Learn what they do. Are they CBT, cognitive behavior therapy based? So that's based on correcting distorted thoughts and automatic actions. It's very good for anxiety-based disorders. It's good for uh, mild to moderate depression. Interpersonal psychotherapy, really good for targeting effects directed at mood in grief and in interpersonal relationships. Or DBT is generally thought to be used best in borderline patients. So those, if you're not familiar with them in your practice, I'm sure everybody has a few, but they tend to be, um, they split a lot. They have a lot of emotional extremes. They have a hard time maintaining relationships. But those people can see a lot, a lot of improvement if they're uh, in the care of someone who's very good at DBT. So uh, I don't wish to, uh, I'll spend a lot more time talking about drugs, but I don't uh, wish to underestimate the importance of psychotherapy uh, in treating your patients and really encouraging them to seek therapeutic services for themselves because they often don't want to talk about it. And our culture has gotten a little bit used to pulling a pill out of a bottle as the way to change things. And, and really long-term um, improvement occurs through psychotherapy and medication. Okay, so I want to do a quick look at bipolar disorders. How many people in the room feel comfortable treating bipolar disorders? <laughs> awesome, so not many. <laughs> that's a good, I think that's probably a good thing. So what I, what I want to do in our discussion is just point out um, how we identify them, right? Because mood disorders, depression, a lot of anxiety disorders, you're probably going to feel pretty comfortable treating. When we walk into bipolar disorder, that's probably something that needs a referral out to a psychiatrist. Um, you might start with one baseline mood stabilizer. That might be something you're comfortable with, but otherwise it comes to me. So what you need to do is identify who's bipolar versus who's just moody. So when we look at uh, the epidemiology of bipolar disorder, there is equal prevalence in men and women for bipolar one. Bipolar two is a threefold higher rate in women. And there's been some suggestion that that has to do with the diagnostic criteria, but we won't get into that. Um, and in general, women have a, like a later onset of bipolar disorder it occurs in their m mid to late 20s versus men occurs early on. And just as an interesting side uh, track for people who do a good social history or are asking about psychiatric history. Um, we do know that women who've experienced um, extreme mood disorder, so like a psychiatric admission at 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 
those women are uh, much more predisposed to have bipolar disorder. Early and extreme mood disorder in young women is generally associated with bipolar disorder. So whether, whether that's going to pan out for your patient, you don't know, but it's a helpful clue when asking about the history, if you see that, to think, huh, maybe this is someone I need to be paying attention to. We also know that women experience more rapid cycling bipolar disorder, and that's characterized by four cycles in 12 months. And I like, it's interesting, right, that women have that because when we talk about four cycles in 12 months, sometimes we're talking about 12 cycles in 12 months. Huh, imagine that, 12 cycles in 12 months. I think of something else when that happens, right? So hormonal transitions are important and particularly important in our bipolar population. So the reason that I, in particular, care about bipolar women is because they can be very sick very quickly. Women with bipolar one have a hundredfold higher risk than women without psychiatric illness of experiencing postpartum psychosis, right? It is our postpartum psychosis women that kill themselves and kill others, including their babies. These are the stories we hear often in the news. So we wanna pay particular attention to identifying these women prior to the pregnancy. Right, the earlier they're identified, sent to psychiatry and treated, the safer the pregnancy is. I'm very comfortable using mood stabilizers throughout the pregnancy with the exception of very few drugs. And so they can be treated and effectively controlled throughout the length of their pregnancy. We know that up to 70% of women with all coming bipolar disorder, one in two will experience depression or mania with one, within one month of delivery, right? So they're at such high risk for having mood disorders coming out of a pregnancy. And these women also have 70 times higher rate of suicide in the first month postpartum. So we need to figure out who they are. So what do they look like? So bipolar one disorder, we're going back to medical school again. Those are the people who have a true manic episode, right? So how do you ask your patient about a manic episode? You can't be like, hey, has there been a time where you've been like pretty up for a couple of days, you got a lot of stuff done there, like totally. I got the house clean, I took care of everything, and I felt great. That's fantastic, right? But we generally refer to that as a hypomanic, or you have to delve into it a little more often. So mania is very severe, right? It is absolutely like no sleep for three, four days. It is grandiosity, this feeling that I am better than the rest of the world. Like, I got this. I know everything, right? It's that rapid pressured speech. And I do this with my patients sometimes. I'll be like, have you ever had a period of time where maybe you started realizing that you started talking faster and you're like, oh my God, I totally want to tell you something super great. And oh my God, did you see that thing about the water on the TV? It was so good and oh my God. And then the thing with the thing and I have to tell you this, right? It's very rapid. It's very, people around you notice. And these people also tend to do very impulsive, very damaging things. I have one man in my practice bought three cars in a day. I have another person who bought two homes. Um, I have, you know, the state of Virginia has a law that actually provides for them to get out of that sort of financial damage, but not many states do. Um, but they might have sex with several different people that they would never do. They're happily married people. Um, they might do drugs that they've never done before spend a lot of money. And we're not talking about, you know, women, we tend to, you know, I like to shop. This is not, um, <laughs> this is not spending, you know, beyond your means. You know, for some of our patients, it's $25, $50. For others of our patients, it's $300, $500. We're talking about $5,000, $10,000, $20,000, $50,000 $50, in the span of 24 to 48 hours. These are the people that wreck their lives if they're unidentified. Sorry, somehow I got off that. So, um, <laughs> So you want to look for the, the single manic episode in a bipolar one. Those are the women who, when pregnant, have the greatly increased chance of postpartum psychosis. Those are the women that need treatment from a psychiatrist throughout their pregnancy and probably throughout their lives. And I will say, I have found this. It's nearly pathognomonic for someone. If you ask them, are you bipolar, and you get their symptoms, and you're like, oh, yeah, you are. And you say, do you think you're bipolar? They say, no, I'm good. Because a person who experiences a manic episode generally wants to experience that again. They don't want your drugs. They don't want you to limit the swing, right? Their mood's up and down. They love it high. So if you put them on meds, they don't like that. So when you see that, when someone's like, no, no. Someone put me on meds once. I did, I did not feel like myself. Ding, ding. 
<laughs> Red flag. <laughs> so these people also have lifetime suicide rates ranging from 10 to 15 percent. That's huge. That's the largest in all of psychiatry. You take a good bipolar one person who has a little touch of bi uh, borderline personality disorder, and bam, it's like your magic combination for death. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I got a little excited about that. So bipolar 2 disorder, right, that's when the manic episode doesn't occur. We call it something like hypomania. That's when you're feeling really good. That's the person who gets the house cleaned all the time. That's the person who takes care of the laundry, the kids, the cleaning, the errands, all in one day. They don't need a whole lot of sleep, but yeah, I slept some. I just felt really good, right? And this is all in... in combination with a major depressive disorder. All bipolar people experience the low, low, right? So they'll all respond to the same questions that we reviewed, the SIGI caps, a major depressive disorder. But what you're separating out is a true manic episode from a hypomanic episode. But interestingly enough, suicide occurs at the same rate in bipolar two people as bipolar one. So again, we really wanna identify these people. Um, the treatment, as I said, I don't think a lot of you use it. I don't think a lot of you need to know this, but it generally consists of mood stabilizers in the presence of SSRIs because that, that deep dip in the mood is often treated with an SSRI, but we do know that that has some risk for increasing the chances of a manic episode. So it's best done under the care of people who feel very comfortable with it. And then we use a lot of uh, second generation antipsychotics. So I included a table just so it's in your notes, but not that I likely think you need it. Okay. So now we're going to move on to some anxiety disorders. We've looked at mood. We're going to look at anxiety. They often occur together. This is going to come up time and time again in these slides, right, that uh, mental disorders are co-occurring and depression and anxiety often go hand in hand. Um, so you're going to want to pay particular attention to that. So I think we're all uh, familiar with anxiety disorders in our practice, but because this pertains to us, what is the prevalence of anxiety disorders in the primary care population? Anyone. Oh my God, good job, everybody. 20%. So it's everywhere, right? So if you're like, wow, I have a particularly calm population of people, like that is fantastic, right? Again, it's not that you do. It's not that they're particularly happy. It's that you're missing it. The questions you're directing probably aren't what they need to be or you don't like to talk about. It. You're too busy. You got 15 minutes to see your patient. You got to talk about diabetes and hypertension and obesity and not eating right. And I got chronic headaches and my back hurts and I need something bisphosphonate, right? So you, got, <laughs> you, you don't have a lot of time, but they're there and we need to, we need to deal with them. So uh, during their lifetimes, women are twice as likely to have all four of the major anxiety disorders, panic, PTSD, GAD, and social phobia. Women, twice as likely to have them. And we do know that there's a heritability component, right? There's familial aggregation for panic, for GAD, for OCD, and for phobias. So when we look at anxiety disorder stats in the US population, you can see it's huge, right? Almost close to 30% lifetime prevalence, 20% of uh, 12 month prevalence. So when you look over the course of a lifetime, look at those demographics for women, right? It's huge, 30% until you're menopausal. That's a lot. One in three women are anxious every day for most part of their day for the entirety of their lives until they're 60. That's a lot. I hope you all aren't feeling too anxious right now. <laughs> And then when we look across a population, right, I put depression and anxiety next door to each other, uh, looking at um, some Center for Disease Control data, and you can see, right, co-occurring illness across race, across ethnicity for depression and generalized anxiety, right, 20, 30, 40 percent. So when we break down what anxiety disorders look like, I, I don't want to go a hundred, you know, spend 10, 20 minutes on this, but um, it's a sort of a tree for easy understanding of what anxiety disorders are. Is it cute or uncute? What do no cues mean, right? So that's a panic attack. When you're just sitting there and you're living your life and all of a sudden, <laughs> right, I can't breathe, I'm going to die, things are closing in, I, I think I'm having a heart attack, right? That's panic. That came out of nowhere. Versus cued anxiety, you see a spider, oh my God! Or you have, um, extreme fear of the scrutiny of others, social phobia. You're reminded of a trauma. You have a flashback, a dissociation, right? That's PTSD or enclosed spaces, what we associate with agoraphobia. 
So if you have a panic attack, um, that's likely panic disorder. If you have associated worry around when you're going to have a panic attack, it becomes panic disorder. And if you don't have panic attacks, then we talk about things like OCD and generalized worry. So looking at them, first panic disorder, like I said to you, um, anxiety and depression and psychiatric illness are co-occurring, right? Uh, women who have a panic disorder have 50 to 60 percent lifetime chance of having major depression and one third have current depression so when you're talking to someone you think they have anxiety you might want to think they also have depression and vice versa and 20 to 25 percent of these women also have a substance dependence issue substance use disorder and the reason you might not be seeing it is because you're not asking about it right because alcoholism is rampant in our population today and so is the uh, misuse or reappropriation of prescribed opiates and prescribed benzodiazepines. So I get to talk a little bit about the benzos today and I get to talk about the opioids tomorrow. Um, but so panic disorder, just so we know, recurrent unexpected panic attacks and then this surrounding worry. When am I gonna get it? What's gonna happen? What am I gonna do? And then you start avoiding things until you sort of end up in a closet, right? Because your world becomes so small, you're so scared to participate in the world that then you're an agoraphobe. You don't wanna come out. What's gonna happen? What am I gonna do? Um, and over time, those uncued panic attacks change the way you inhibit, that you inhabit the world and you end up like a specific phobia or social phobia. You won't go out in crowds. You won't go to Walmart. You never go to your favorite dance club because, oh my God, what's gonna happen? Um, this is uh, what panic attack looks like. Discrete periods of intense fear with four of the following symptoms. And I do, uh, it is important to note that sometimes I, you probably have patients who come there like, I was so anxious and like for, I thought I was gonna die. And I'll say, well, how long did it last? Four hours, three days, it was horrible. Right, that's not a panic attack. Panic attack is a discrete period of time with the peak of symptoms at about 10 minutes, right? And then it goes away. These are the people that frequently end up in an ER, right? They really do feel like they're dying. Um, it's a very real fear and it tends to build on itself. That's the nature of the whole disorder. Episodes sudden, peak rapidly, often accompanied by a sense of danger and frequently present to the ER. So what do we do for treatment of these people? So 70% are treatable, right? That's a huge number. We take away things that make you excitable, right? So caffeine, nicotine, alcohol, drugs, your Adderall, you might think of coming down on that. <laughs> um, you probably need um, some education about what's happening. I, I have my patient all the time like, Dr. Weldon, but I'm gonna die. And I say, well, so you've had these, what, for about 10 years? How many times have you died? And they'll be like, whoa. You know, not yet. And I say, that's because you don't die. You're not going to die. And that's like reassuring, right? Because they really believe it. So to hear someone in your position say to them, you're not going to die. You're going to feel miserable. And it's going to go away in a half an hour. And you don't have to use that little zanny in your pocket, right? Because that's not the way we get over it. We get over it by talking about it, by learning how to deal with our cues, and by going to therapy. And sometimes, often, we use some medications. So I'm sort of, we'll see how we go on this. Uh, all anxiety disorders generally follow the same hierarchy of medications, SSRIs. We often use in panic other uh, sedating medications, right, because they're happy. And then as sort of last line treatment or uh, sporadic short-term use of benzodiazepines. But I can go through uh, sort of the litany of medications that I use in anxiety disorder. You're probably all fairly comfortable using them but I can go down that list in a bit. Let's just make it through. So generalized anxiety disorder, right? That chronic everyday worry. 99% of women who suffer from generalized anxiety disorder have at least one other lifetime access one diet disorder, right? 66% have a current access one disorder. Just like I said, the top four anxiety disorders, female to male ratio, two to one. Generalized anxiety disorder occurs in four to 7% of the general population. That's a lot of people. So if you're not diagnosing generalized anxiety disorder, you're missing it. So what is it? It's excessive worry. You're worrying more days than not for six months. You're worried about everything. 
oh my God, my kids are they're sick. Something's going to happen. I don't know what I'm going to do. I can't get through my day. What am I going to do? I'm just so tired. I can't think. I just I fly off the handle in a second. I feel these people have a lot of somatic symptoms. I get super nervous. My stomach hurts. My back pain. I, I'm tired. I don't know what to do. Right? They often feel hard to deal with. They, they're like draining. But there's simple solutions for them. So it's good to identify. Um, we use a lot of different medications, right? And these are the people where I think we have a large discrepancy. They worry a lot. They're very anxious, but they're chronically anxious every day. These people should not be given a benzodiazepine, right? That's dangerous for them. That's asking them not to use a medication that is very, very successful in treating their anxiety. So. Why aren't they going to use it? Because it's not safe, right? It's not safe to use every day for years at a time. So we use things like SSRIs, Wellbutrin, Venlafaxine, Gabapentin, Vistaril, Atarax, Seroquel, Risperdal, beta blockers, Clonidine, <coughs> a, a, a whole slew of medications to try to bring down the adrenergic tone so they can relax a little bit without the chronic um, uh, dangers that benzodiazepines present. And they too do well with therapy, right? So that's a really good thing. Um, then we also, right, I can't emphasize this enough, and I'm sure you guys talk about this all the time, like exercise, meditation, stop your smoking, turn down the Coca-Cola. And I'm a Coca-Cola fanatic, so that is hard for me to say. But it's still the truth that people would do better if they took better care of themselves. It reduces anxiety. I can't say enough about meditation and relaxation. Right? Those really add to people's lives, and I'm lucky. I've had a meditation practice for 20 years. I do support it with my patients. I also do group therapy for substance use disorders, and we do meditative group therapy. I really think it's something, if you don't have a couple of names in your pocket, that you can tell patients, look this up on the Internet. Try this. I think it's worthwhile, and I'm happy to hand that out, who I use, if that would be helpful at the end. Um, social anxiety disorder. So those are people marked fear in social situations, and they're worried about the scrutiny of others, that they're being judged, that they'll be humiliated. Um, and exposure to that situation, it provokes anxiety. The anxiety is very heightened. So it's out of proportion to the actual threat, and it lasts more than six months. And the treatment for this is very much the same as the, as the litany of medications I just discussed before. And a big, big focus, again, on therapy, right? Psychotherapy helps these people. OK, so let's get to the case so I can get on my soapbox. My nerves are shot. How many of you hear this? Because <laughs> I hear it. I will tell you, I literally hear it twice a day. So Sandra R., 58-year-old new patient, right? You don't know much about her. She presents with a chief complaint of anxiety, having recently moved to the area. She's been hospitalized a number of times over the last 10 years with acute decompensation and has been followed for her anxiety by her primary care doctor. Awesome. She's getting follow-up. That's great. She feels the medication she's been prescribed for about 10 to 20 years has saved her life. It has changed everything about what I do. Although she recently says she's been drinking more, as she just feels the meds aren't working as well as they used to. So you look back on review of her medical records, or oftentimes these patients will tell you, well, the thing that saved my life is clonopin, or clonazepam, or Valium, or Stanax. And I take one milligram three, four times a day as needed. But I found I'm using about, I don't know, four or five, because Dr. Wells, it doesn't help. I just keep getting anxious. I got, I'm going to need more. I think I need more. So what do you do? This patient's sitting in your office. What do you guys do? <laughs> Great answer. So, yes, that, that, that is what happens. That's why I see them one to two times a day. <laughs> and what I want to do, so what I want to do is kind of have this discussion that we want to prevent this from happening, right? These patients are so common, and, and particularly in this day and age, because we've had a sort of a different idea about the use of uh, addictive narcotics for about the last two decades, three decades, since the 80s, right? Big Pharma has been pushing the oxys, pushing the Valium, like let's get out there and treat our patients. And so we've created this, this maelstrom of problems that 
now comes somewhat to psychiatry to deal with, which is fine with me, but also for you guys going forward, what's the treatment? Because all your patients can come into your office and they know how to say Valium. Or I just once, my mom gave me this drug, Dr. Wells. It was so good. Um, it was a uh, clonus, clonus. Mm -hmm. Maybe it began with a Z. Z <laughs> right, and they'll look at you like you don't know. And you have to sit there, and I sit there, like, and I'm like, you know, because we do a lot of Columbo in psychiatry. Huh. <laughs> what is it? What was the name? I, I don't know. Hard, hard to say. Hard to say. <laughs> huh. Huh. Well, maybe you can go back and find out some information for me. But in general, right, I suggest you don't take other people's medication. <laughs> Anyways, you get the story. So the idea is, what are we going to do, right? What are we going to do with this space? For you guys, we got we to gotta start at the beginning, right? There's little doubt that benzodiazepines are incredibly helpful in reducing anxiety, inducing sleep, stopping panic, right? But they have significant risks. It's like I said to you, I mean, it's asking a lot of your patient who's experiencing a lot of anxiety to give them a little tiny pill. It's teeny tiny, it can't be that bad. Give them a little pill and it works like that, right? 25 minutes, woo, I feel good, right? So to ask someone, who has these chronic symptoms to not take that pill is asking for me too much of them. They can't do that. And you have to lower their expectations and increase their education so that they become more informed about how we deal with these problems. And I know grandma's had a Valium script for 35 years, but that doesn't make it correct to care, right? That's not the standard of practice anymore and we have to teach our patients another way. So. Uh, in case you don't know, but you probably do, benzodiazepines have significant hazards, right? They're toxic and lethal when, when used with synergistic CNS depressants, which are medications that patients are taking every day. Antidepressants, neuroleptics, anticonvulsants, antihistamines, don't forget your alcohol, right? Your opiates that like half, um, three quarters of America has. They now look at opioid prescriptions and they say that there's enough opioid prescriptions currently in circulation so that every American household has a bottle of pills in their medicine cabinet. Right? So these people have ready access to medications that could kill them. We know that <coughs> benzodiazepines slow you down. But um, paradoxically, they disinhibit you, right? So you're slower, you feel calm, but you make poorer decisions, so you're impulsive. So you're gonna get in that car because you really want some beer and you're gonna drive to the store, right? That's a, that's a bad combination. They cause memory impairment, particularly in the elderly. So I wanna look at particular, uh, the particular importance of not giving elderly people access to benzodiazepines. Even if they've been on it for 20 years, we have to find a better way. On the long term, chronic benzodiazepines cause depression and emotional blunting, right? They cause the exact thing you're trying to help. Um, of course, we do not use them in pregnancy. So anybody that is of reproductive age, they probably shouldn't be on them in the first place. Because we all know that you know greater than 60% of pregnancies are unplanned. So why do we want to introduce that problem? We know that benzodiazepines cause tolerance, dependence, withdrawal, right? There's seizures. And as you said, it's tacky. It's tacky to have a patient seizing because they run out of their benzos. So. Some of what I use, right, I don't use Xanax. I have no patient in the entirety of my practice, and I deal with women almost exclusively who's on Xanax unless they come to me as a transfer from one of you. <laughs> no, no, no harm, no foul. So, um, but then my job is to transition them off because I see almost no use for Xanax in clinical practice with the exception of very, very rare cases. Um, Patients who have a history of addiction or active drug or substance abuse, right? You can't use benzodiazepines because again, you're triggering the neural pathways of addiction that are gonna refuel an addiction that they may have already recovered from. And that's a really sad thing for them. In the elderly, we know um, that benzodiazepines have particular risks, psychomotor slowing, 
cognitive dysfunction, paradoxical disinhibition, right? Those old people, you don't want them saying inappropriate stuff, right? They get in trouble for that. Um, we know that um, benzodiazepines increase the rate of falls, right? That causes hip and femur fractures that causes them to die more frequently. So that's not good. Um, it increases the likelihood of, of motor vehicle accidents. And as I said before, cognitive impairment, memory impairment, some of which may be reversible and some of it which may not be. So here we're looking at um, the percentage of uh, benzodiazepine drug use, and you can see it's going up, 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 right? And it's all throughout the lifespan. So we need to be very careful about what we're using with these people. So what do you do? We go back to Sandra. My nerves are shot. She comes to me. So what I find the most important thing is education. You have to teach them about their disease, and you have to teach them about the medications that they've been on. They're going to be generally very resistant to changing, but you have to hold the boundary. And if you can't, which we discussed earlier, you send to psychiatry, right, it is my job. My patients frequently, every day, 10 times a day, I'm Dr. West. Um, so I've been taking those medications, but nothing really works like the clonopin. So I'm just going to need some more of that. Right? Dr. Wells, um, I was talking to my mom, and she says the clonopin is the best thing ever, so I'm going to need some of that. Dr. Wells, um, my Valium I got from my OB, and I've run out. But she said you would refill it. Right? They use any number, very hesitant, reluctant to change their medication practices. You have to teach them to do that. So there's a great campaign from um, the American Board of Internal Medicine. It's called the Choosing Wisely campaign. It provides a lot of information about benzodiazepine risks and hazards. So that's something you can refer your patients to because there have been good studies that show when patients are informed about the hazards of benzodiazepine use, they're actually more likely to change. Then you've got to suggest alternatives, right? You've got to have choices. So what are the choices that I use? I use a lot, as I said before, for chronic anxiety, which is what most of these people have. They might have panic in addition, but they have long-standing anxiety. Anybody who's been on a, on a benzo for longer than six weeks, right? That's sort of a problem. I start, we have to talk about an SSRI, right? Good drugs in the use of anxiety. We have to talk about something like buspirone, maybe gabapentin. Maybe Seroquel, Vistaril, Atarax, Clonidine, a beta blocker, right? And my last line, coming to the end, maybe a little hint of some clonopin. But that's it. Um, and then when you're, for me, and this might not pertain to you, but if you want, I just included um, a taper schedule that I use frequently uh, that you may or may not want. What, these patients have to be tapered down. If they're on something uh, high potency short term agent like Xanax, I change it over. Uh, in elderly, I'm much more likely to use lorazepam or Ativan just because of single pass metabolism. It's generally a bit safer for them than clonopin. You don't want something sitting around for 18 hours. But in general, I try to go with, like I don't tell a patient we're going to discontinue this tomorrow. Thanks for coming in. Good to see you. I say, let's have six months, right? Let's try a six month contract. And I write it out for them and I discuss it every visit, which I know is time consuming, but they need the reinforcement. And it's an initial 25% reduction in week one, 25% reduction in week two, and then about 10% thereafter until they are successfully weaned. I'm gonna get off my soapbox now. What do you guys use for chronic anxiety? Were those medication suggestions helpful? Not really. You're going to send it to me. Okay, that's fine with me. So the last thing I want to finish up with is sort of the complex inter in interplay of hormones and mood, right? This is sort of what I do, and I'll tell you the data is very confusing, and the hormones uh, interact with our, our uh, hormonal axes inherent in our bodies in many different ways. Uh, but I just want to reiterate that neuropsychiatric illness has a strong sex bias, right? We've seen it over and over again. Women have a twofold greater risk than males of almost all depression and anxiety disorders. We know that affective disorders, mood disorders, depression, bipolar disorder are commonly associated with dysregulation of the HPA axis, right? HPA axis is our stress axis. When you're under stress, when you're depressed, right, your HPA axis goes off. And in chronically anxious people, chronically depressed people, we see a blunting of the HPA axis. So it's sort of chronically, tonically on. So you sort of constantly feel stressed out. That's a bad place to be. We know that steroid hormones, gonadal steroids in particular, estrogen with respect to women, 
primarily affects the activation and organization of the HPA axis, has a big impact on how our HP axis functions, so how much stress, how much depression, and concomitantly how much anxiety. Antidepressants work in part to normalize the glucocorticoid response. We don't really know how, but we like that it does, so we keep using them. Welcome to psychiatry. Um, so I've talked a little bit about mood disorder specific in women, um, depression and puberty, or PMDD, depression and pregnancy, postpartum depression, postpartum psychosis, depression and menopause. I've said several times that depression tends to decrease as women age until the perimenopausal transition, and then we see a spike. I'm sure most of you have seen mood disorders in and around the use of oral contraceptives, as well as oral contraceptives helping mood disorders, right? It goes both ways, which is very confusing and complicated. And we still don't really understand the mechanisms of that, except it occurs and we probably can all shake our heads and say, yes, we know it's there. And then there's depression associated with sterility, right? The loss of hormones altogether. So I've included, oh God, the menstrual cycle and the hormones, right? This is like a nightmare for medical school for me. Um, and then also just right there, a look at how estrogen uh, and progesterone fluctuate in relation to brain serotonin activity, right? You can see they trace a similar line, so we know that they impact one another. And then this is just so you can have it. I think it's fairly <clears throat> complicated, but in general, estrogen increases serotonergic tone and progesterone decreases serotonergic tone. So you, if you think about that in depressive Episodes, estrogen helps us feel better, right? Progesterone doesn't. So when you look at that with the menstrual cycle, right, it, it correlates just what we think and see in our patients. And then this is a little look at GABA and glutamate, just so you realize that the influence of gonadal sex hormones across the hormonal spectrum is very wide. It's all there. And then I included this too, that we know that pregnenolone um, also decreases GABA receptor, GABA receptor associated with anxiety and all anxiety disorders, right? So um, they're complicated interplays. It's probably beyond the scope of this, but I just wanted you to have it. And then just to finish with a little bit of fun, I'm fine, I hate you, I love you. I want ice cream, come here, go away. Does anybody have some oranges? So thank you, appreciate your time. <laughs>